Welcome everyone for Agile India 2021. Thank you for joining this session today with us. And so we have this session talking about technical debt prioritization uh, by Naresh. So I'll hand it over to Naresh uh, to give us a quick introduction and uh, start the session. Thanks, Parveen. And uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the session today. We're going to be talking about technical debt prioritization, one of the topics that I think uh, many people are really uh, you know, confronted with, uh, especially in, in today's day and time. And tech debt in general seems to have gotten a little bit of a bad, uh, you know, people have a bad taste when they think about tech debt. And like Ward Cunningham this morning, our keynote speaker spoke about, it's actually, uh, tech debt is actually a great metaphor for saying that it's not really bad. We all uh, time to time take a small uh, you know, a short term, low interest loan, uh, you know, to speed up certain things. And if you think of technical debt from that perspective, uh, you know, it, it can be quite powerful. It can give you additional working capital to do things which maybe your competitors won't be able to do. Of course, the uh, if you end up taking, you know, what I call long term uh, high interest loans, uh, which means you just you know, keep taking on building technical debt, uh, it will, uh, you, you know, it will get you to a grinding stall, uh, stop. And that's something that I'm sure uh, most of you might have uh, experienced as well. So uh, with that, let's kind of uh, jump into the topic and I'm going to, uh, you know, hopefully give you some uh, techniques uh, in terms of how you can uh, visualize the tech debt and then prioritize the tech debt and kind of get it addressed. Uh, all of this work is uh, very much based on, uh, you know, my uh, experience uh, coaching teams, helping teams, and also building my own product. For example, the platform that we are currently using, Confingen, uh, that's something that uh, was also kind of, uh, we, we use the same approach for doing this. Uh, so the first question uh, that often comes to my mind is uh, how do we know we have tech debt, right? How do we know we have tech debt? So if you can please use your chat uh, and uh, put in your thoughts, I would appreciate that. So what do you think, uh, you know, what, what, what lets you know, what indicators tell you that you have tech debt uh, on your team? Let's see the chat. Outdated versions of software, leaking issues, lots of bugs, uh, manual testing needed. Uh, wow, okay. Taking shortcuts, fraud issues, again, bugs. Outdated versions of third-party software. Yeah, so vulnerability-related issues. Uh, developers keep asking to rewrite code, missing clean code, low productivity. Fantastic. So great. That, that's, uh, that's absolutely some of the things that, uh, you know, are, are good indicators that we have uh, tech debt. Let me hide this chat thing again. Uh, so here's what, uh, you know, we put together uh, over the last few years, uh, trying to help us uh, see uh, whether we have tech debt and whether it's uh, impacting us or not. Uh, so the, the first thing that, uh, you know, I, I think people mentioned about this is some way to, to basically visualize uh, what, uh, what is your bug leakage? And then essentially uh, also what are the root cause associated with that? So if you can, uh, you know, have some way to basically visualize maybe over the last 30 days, what are the uh, what are the number of bugs that leak through your various environments that you might have? So you might have a test stage and a prod environment uh, or, or some other combinations. Uh, what, 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 quantity of defects leaked through these uh, stages and then what were the root causes uh, of these and possibly even uh, you know filter by priority and so forth and see uh, you know what's causing you know so this can be a indicator of uh, you know technical debt and as you can see here uh, i think uh, this team does seem to have a challenge of technical debt 
The next one that you might want to look at is what I call as effort distribution. That is, uh, you know, what percentage of uh, overall time is the team spending on uh, feature development, even in features, there may be different kinds of features uh, versus basically, uh, you know, fixing bugs and so forth. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, you know, 80% of the time, uh, the team seems to be spending on defect fixes, which means the, uh, the reliability of this software is quite questionable and so uh, you know th this is another indicator that could tell you uh, that you know uh, you you may have a, a tech debt issue uh, but one of the most powerful things uh, is to look at is essentially try to visualize the cycle time for different kinds of uh, things and so, for example, here you will see that for new features, uh, this particular team that we are looking at uh, is on an average taking 158 days to get the feature out. Uh, and that seems like quite a lot of time, I mean, in today's day and age. Uh, of course, this is contextual depending on uh, the kind of scale and complexity of the product that you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, I would still say 158 days is a very long cycle from, uh, you know, from idea to cash kind of a thing. And here, we're not even really taking idea to cash. We are saying actually from actual design start to uh, production deploy. Uh, and what you can also visualize in this graph here is you see the uh, the basically the blue line indicates the average, uh, and then you can see a whole bunch of dots on top of it, uh, which indicates basically uh, certain outliers. And if you you know if you probably analyze them, you might realize that there are certain uh, root causes which is causing this delay, and uh, it's quite likely that tech debt might be an issue causing this. So that's another way to quickly visualize. And the last one that I would actually look at is a, is a metric known as flow efficiency uh, to try and see essentially, you know, uh, if a particular item takes, uh, let's say, 100 days to finish, uh, what percentage of that time actually was spent actual uh, on actual you know in the actual work centers versus you know uh, waiting and stuff like that right and so this gives you an indication that if you if if your efficiency is pretty low uh, that means there is a lot of process debt that you have accumulated uh, and that might be a, an issue to handle separately uh, but you know again trying to segregate the different kinds of debts might help you you know uh, with this so th these are kind of some of the things and of course uh, this is not really measurable, but uh, I'm sure all of you can relate to this uh, in terms of, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, when developers show this expression, you know you have a serious problem of technical debt. Uh, I wish we had a way to measure these. Uh, unlike the previous ones, this is not really something that we found a way to measure. Of course, you can do surveys and other kinds of things, but uh, nothing like, you know, looking at people's expression when you show them a code. Maybe AI can help us. Uh, but then the question is, OK, I understand that we have a problem of technical debt, but then how do we deal with this? Right? How do we get started? Like, where do we start? What do we do about it? Uh, how do we convince other people? So there may be a lot of those questions that you may have. Uh, I think before we jump into anything, it's important to take a commercial break and talk the next uh, 30 minutes about myself. And then we'll come back to this topic at the end of the five minutes. Yeah, makes sense. All right, my name is Naresh Jain. I live in Mumbai, don't act in Bollywood yet. Uh, I run a consulting company called Accensio. Uh, I started my career actually building neural networks for ISRO. Of course, uh, 20 plus years ago, neural networks were shit, so didn't get anywhere with that. Uh, I joined a company called ThoughtWorks. That's where I learned a lot of uh, extreme programming practices and kind of uh, started the Agile India conference, in fact, uh, back in ThoughtWorks in 2004. Uh, I was then fortunate to be part of uh, DirectEye, which is again an, uh, an amazing kind of a company which basically grew, uh, you know, and built many successful uh, products and sold them. Uh, I, I also happened to be part of uh, Hike Messenger's leadership team and helping them, uh, you know, implement a, uh, you know, hypothesis-driven development culture within the organization. Uh, 
So it's part of industrial logic, uh, building e-learning for helping developers uh, learn some of the technical skills. Uh, I started my own, uh, you know, uh, product, uh, you know, or platform, if you will, uh, to help kids uh, learn mental arithmetics uh, didn't really work out, had to shut it down. Uh, and as some of you know, I've been involved with running various conferences in India, uh, you know, started with Agile India, but then kind of grown and uh, run a whole bunch of different kinds of conferences. Uh, because of the conferences, of course, to scratch my own personal itch, I started building Confingen and, uh, you know, a small team of uh, folks have come together to build this platform. Uh, and today, here we are running the entire conference of this platform. Who knew uh, when we started? Uh, I've been fortunate to uh, have worked with some of these fun, fantastic companies and learned from them over the years. But uh, over the last two years, a uh, little over two years now, I've been very deeply involved with uh, Geo uh, and kind of uh, helping them with the uh, with the digital transformation that they're trying in India, driving in India. In fact, tomorrow you will uh, see Anish and Kiran uh, come in, uh, the CEO and the president, uh, and uh, hopefully we will have some very interesting insights uh, from them in terms of uh, how you know uh, Mark Zuckerberg talks about uh, move fast and break things, but at Geo we talk about move fast and scale things. So we'll see that in action. Uh, anyway, enough about me and my nonsense. Let's come back to uh, you know talking about debt uh, and technical debt. Uh, one of the things that uh, often uh, kind of gets me, uh, you know, thinking is that people think of technical debt uh, almost in a single dimension. But uh, there are many different types of debt here are just few examples on the screen, there could be many more. Uh, and so what we've tried to do is visualize essentially on the left, there is a, a set of architectural components, if you will. And then on the right, there are certain different uh, at, uh, categories uh, of, of things that can come in. And you can start classifying these things into these different buckets just to help you understand you know, uh, what all you should pay attention to. Often uh, we look at uh, things like sonar or stuff like that, and they, they, they give you only a partial view of the world. Uh, you know, they may give you certain standards view of uh, coding and stuff like that. Uh, but there are actually a lot of interesting tools out there and a lot of, uh, in some cases, not enough tools uh, that may help you actually look at that, you know, tech debt is far more than just code quality. Uh, tech debt can also be, uh, I think someone mentioned mentioned on the chat as well earlier could be related to tech stack you know you could be using an outdated language and you want to move to a latest greatest language because that you uh, programming language i mean that could give you a, a big benefit in terms of the developer experience in terms of the safety uh, and so forth uh, there's also debt related to performance uh, and so forth so uh, what I wanted to just highlight again, don't want to spend too much time here, but uh, it's important to think about debt uh, in 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 you know in in multiple dimensions, not a unidimension. And uh, you know, technical debt is more than sonar code quality. Just wanted to highlight that. All right. This is if if there is one most important slide in whatever I'm going to talk. I think it's it's this slide. Uh, this is what we've been using for for a few years now in terms of basically the thought process uh, in terms of addressing uh, technical debt, right? So the the step number one is essentially visualize, right? You say statistics, tech debt, statistics, whatever you can get get some numbers to help you visualize basically what is the situation we are in. Uh, once you have visualized the situation, then you can triage and decide whether you want to go down the refactor or the rewrite route. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, each of these items. Uh, and then once you've decided what path you want to go down, that's when you want to now say, hey, of course, we don't want to do a big bang of anything. Uh, so how do I prioritize so that I can get the biggest bang for the buck and I can uh, incrementally pay off my debt uh, you know, over a period of time. Uh, 
and also get validation whether what I'm doing is actually helping or not. And uh, finally, it's about uh, you know more of the strategy in terms of what uh, approach you're going to use. Are you going to look like, uh, go down a strangler pattern? Are you going to uh, you know look at a tool to guide you? So uh, we will talk about different strategies that can help you. So uh, this is basically the overall zoomed out view of the world in terms of addressing tech debt and prioritizing it. Now let's deep dive into each of these sections. So the first one uh, we will get into visualize and I'm going to give you uh, various different uh, snapshots of uh, tools that I have personally used uh, that that basically helps me understand and visualize uh, the, the, the scale of uh, the tech debt that we are in. Uh, Often it's a question of how do I convince other people? And uh, I think the first uh, important thing is to actually visualize and help people understand how uh, how bad the situation is. Uh, I know if you've attended uh, Linda Rising's keynote yesterday, she talked about, uh, you know, we think we are data driven, but we are mostly making emotional decisions. Uh, while that is, that is true, I agree with that. I think uh, there is uh, in, in, in her own uh, influencing strategies, uh, there is a pattern about basically using uh, data to, to, to strike that emotional, uh, you know, uh, to strike the emotional chord with people. And so sometimes, you know, uh, when, when talking about technical debt and trying to convince people, uh, the most important thing is to help them visualize how big a problem it is and what would be possibly the consequences or how it is actually hurting you. So visualizing that kind of uh, becomes very critical to convince other people, in my opinion. So of course, uh, we can start with the standard sonar way of looking at things. And this uh, certainly gives you a, a good first step uh, where it basically is uh, on this screen, if you will see on the bottom, uh, sonar has a way to say uh, how long it would take to fix this tech debt. So it, on the bottom, it's the duration to fix the tech debt. On the left, it basically plots against the code coverage that you have and uh, basically says from zero to uh, you know 100. And then uh, the, the size of these bubbles is basically equivalent to the lines of the code uh, that we are looking at. And so the one here on the top right corner is a big bubble. Uh, it has highest uh, tech debt in terms of the duration it would take to fix, and it also has the lowest coverage. Uh, so this might help people understand that, hey, you know, look at this. Uh, this is uh, the kind of tech, tech debt situation we are in. Uh, we do have some things here on the bottom left corner, which are actually pretty good, but there are things here on the top right corner that are problematic, right? That are that are problematic. And this is, this is a standard tool telling you that. Uh, once you have something like this, you can go for something more advanced. Uh, there is a tool called Code Scene. Last year, we had Adam uh, who, who built Code Scene uh, speak at the conference. He also ran a workshop. Uh, it's a fantastic tool to help you visualize hotspots in your application. Uh, it helps you see if the health of your code is improving or not. And it's a great way to start putting some metric behind a lot of uh, you know, uh, data points uh, being combined together and helping you kind of look at hotspots, health, etc. Uh, and it gives you some very actionable things from here. But this could be kind of uh, beyond Sonar Code Code uh, Sonar Code uh, Sonar Cube. Sorry, uh, this could be Code Scene. Could be your kind of next uh, level up, if you will. Uh, long back, I also built this tool uh, called C3. It's an open source tool. What it helps you do is it helps you visualize uh, the quality of your code uh, from three dimensions. One is basically, uh, so C3 stands for coverage, uh, complexity, and churn. Uh, so it looks at what is the coverage of this code, uh, code coverage. Uh, second is it looks at cyclomatic complexity. And third, it looks at churn. Churn is basically how often this particular file or method is changed. And, uh, and basically my point was that, you know, if you look at each of these metric in isolation, uh, they actually don't tell you much. Uh, so it's not a great idea to look at, uh, you know, code coverage or any of these things in isolation. For example, I might have very low coverage 
on a code that is extremely simple, uh, simplistic code. It's just maybe like, you know, if you're using Java, it's just getters and setters, right? And this code is never ever changed. Once it's there, nobody ever touches it. Like, do I really need to worry that this has low coverage? No, probably not, right? What I need to worry about is I have this code, which is extremely complex, uh, which means the cyclomatic complexity is very high. It has very low coverage, which means it's complex, but, and then there's no safety. Uh, and this code is very frequently being changed. It could be changed because there are a lot of bugs. It could be changed because that's a, uh, that's an area in which a lot of uh, developers are working. So, you know, this is a very simplistic way of trying to identify uh, what is a hotspot in your application? Uh, this is a tree map visualization. So basically, all these boxes, the the ones with uh, you know the, this kind of a box is basically a package, and then within that you can see smaller files and so forth. And you can further do a drill down and kind of go uh, deeper into each of these, and it may give you uh, you know what exactly is a troublesome area within this. And the idea here was to look for the biggest uh, black or the red spot. I mean, black here is basically a black hole. It's beyond recovery in some sense, uh, but you would look for the biggest black area and try and prioritize that to fix it. So these are all purely based on uh, you know the quality of the code. Now I'm going to slightly shift my focus to uh, you could use something like Lighthouse for front end stuff uh, for for web applications, and you could look at performance, uh, and it gives you some very useful metric uh, you know by which you can measure how good your page is, right? And this is certainly a form of debt uh, that that needs to be addressed. And uh, you know this is this is what we call as the uh, with fit into the performance side of things. Uh, so this is a different uh, kind of debt. Uh, unfortunately, you won't get this out of Sonar. So you know you need to look at other things beyond Sonar again, in my point. You could also look at basically you know the, uh, the network, uh, the, the this tab, and then try to understand basically uh, how long each of the APIs are taking and uh, how long uh, you know it is taking to render certain things and stuff like that. You can look at now uh, beyond that, you can start looking at which of the performance metrics. Uh, again, there's an open source tool that uh, Hari and I have built. It's called Perfis. It helps you. It gives you standard dashboards straight out of the box. You just need to give your Docker container and it can start running some uh, performance tests around it. And this can give, it can start helping you understand that as you scale uh, you know, your RPS or your TPS, how uh, essentially your resources are performing and so forth. And this can be another way to visualize uh, you know, whether you have a performance debt or not. Uh, of course, uh, if you uh, you know, there's also on the database side, you you have tools like uh, you know AWR reports that can tell you slow queries, that can tell you you know problems with your indexes, that can tell you other kinds of problems. So there are uh, AWR reports that are available in most tools that can give you uh, insights, uh, you know, and they can tell you whether. Uh, you know, you have debt accumulating on the database side of things. Uh, so again, just giving you a few examples of uh, various things that you should look at in terms of helping you visualize uh, what is the kind of tech debt and kind of build a, a business case around this saying, uh, you know, what is, what is important. Once you have, uh, I'm going to now fast track a little bit, but once you have essentially uh, visualize things, then the next step is to say, okay, what am I going to now do about this? Uh, is this something that I would be able to uh, refactor and rescue or would this need a rewrite? Uh, and, and, you know, of course, both of them have, uh, you know, their, their pros and cons. There isn't like a uh, best answer in this particular case. Uh, there are risks associated with rewrites. There's a whole bunch of risks I've listed over here. Uh, most of you must be familiar, but there are risks associated with rewrite and there are risks associated with refactor. Uh, both of these are problematic. So in my experience, I, I generally prefer a hybrid approach. 
uh, what is a hybrid approach? So a hybrid approach basically is to say that uh, I would refactor to decouple the pieces and then I would look at individual pieces and, uh, you know, at times it's just much easier to kind of just rewrite those smaller components. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if, if you're aware of uh, Michael Feathers, uh, he's, he's one of the guys who wrote the, actually he's the guy who wrote the refactoring with the legacy code book. Uh, uh, sorry, not refactoring with legacy code, but rather working effectively with legacy code. And, uh, you know, Michael Feathers and I were talking about this notion that what if all your code came with an expiry date? Uh, on a certain date, the code would just disappear. Uh, and if, if that's the notion with which, uh, you know, imagine you're designing things that your code has an expiry date, uh, then the chances are you will design things in a very decoupled manner. So they are small pieces that each of them have a different expiry date. And then you need to kind of constantly plug and play new pieces into them. Right. And that's, that's the way I think of an hybrid approach where uh, I decouple the pieces using a uh, using a refactoring and then i i think of each of these pieces having a expiry date which will need which will mean i just replace those pieces uh, with the latest greatest stuff uh, so that's kind of one way to think about uh, you know this this whole uh, refactor versus rewrite approach which is a hybrid of the two uh, let's come to the prioritization piece because I think that's where I really want to spend some time. Uh, so given that you, uh, you were, you visualized, uh, then you went into deciding which approach you want to use by triaging. Now you want to decide how you're going to prioritize things. You know, you don't want to do things in a big bang manner. You want to do things in a incremental, uh, manner. So you get feedback and you iterate over it. Um, so one, one way to help you prioritize, and this is something I recently did on a project, is basically take the, uh, take the log file, the access log file. Uh, you know, if you're using something like Nginx or whatever, you can take the access log file and just we wrote a simple uh, script to help us visualize that basically every day, uh, what are uh, the most frequently hit API calls, okay? So it helps you say, yeah, like this blue line over here seems to be the most used uh, API call. And then the, uh, the next line uh, seems to be the second most. And so you can get a sense of what is the most used uh, API call. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking at the back end, of course, I'm, I'm just giving an example of, uh, you know, trying to prioritize uh, on the back end how you're going to refactor uh, or rewrite. <clears throat> So uh, one way to do is to visualize the, uh, the, the, the logs and see what is most frequently being hit. Uh, you could also come up with a cumulative uh, number and you could pick the one with the highest uh, number of requests. Uh, and that, that could help you basically uh, identify a starting point, a prioritization mechanism, uh, which is basically used looking at the usage statistics. Uh, on the front end, there are a lot of tools that basically tell you what are the hotspots, what are the most clicked areas on your application. And you might decide that, hey, this component, which is actually, you know, 10% of the overall clicks is pretty important and it has some technical debt. Uh, and this component is what I want to start refactoring or rewriting first. And then next I will deal with the, the other ones. So, uh, you know, again, this is a looking at the uh, click rate uh, and, and basically using that as a, uh, as a data point to prioritize, to help you prioritize what in your front end application you may want to prioritize, right? So this is another example of a prioritization for front end. Uh, you can, of course, look at Sonar. And again, Sonar gives you a very uh, good way to basically visualize uh, where your uh, technical debt is. And you can say, hey, I want this <clears throat> big red spot over here to make it smaller and greener, right? And so basically to do that, I need to start moving it uh, down and left. Uh, and so that's, again, another way you can help prioritize out of all of these things. I will start with the, with the one where I'm going to get the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, I, I earlier talked already about uh, code scene. Code scene also gives you a very uh, 
you know uh, already a prioritized list of things that according to it are uh, clear hotspots that you need to address and it looks at things like what is most frequently changing similar stuff like c3 that i talked about it kind of looks at similar data uh, but a little bit more actually so it's a little bit more advanced uh, and it gives you already a prioritized list of things that you should attack from a code quality point of view uh, so here are kind of few uh, techniques that I, uh, you know, that I've used uh, in terms of helping uh, prioritize where do we start from, right? Uh, what is the most important thing we should be looking at? Uh, on the database side, you can also look at, uh, you know, what are the most frequently hit queries and, you know, what are the most frequently used entities in your database and kind of, again, use that as a prioritization. So in short, what I'm saying is that depending on what architectural layer you're looking at, you look at usage statistics as a way to guide you what is important. And then you blend that with the statistics that you get from uh, things like sonar or uh, code scene or c3 or other things and then you say okay you know given out of all of this i want to this is like let's say the most important microservice and then within that i'm then going to deep dive into sonar or one of these tools and help me you know refine it assuming that you have done all of that uh now it's time to actually you've identified what you want to fix now is the time to actually say how you're going to go about fixing this. Okay, so uh, there is a little, uh, you know, we don't know what to call this. This is not, neither a framework nor a template, it's somewhere in between, but uh, just for the heck of it, we just call it continuous evolution. And so we say we need to, so we identified a backlog item, right? We prioritize and we identified a backlog item. From here, we've also identified based on certain baseline KPIs. So you capture the certain baseline KPIs. Now you define what your target KPI should be for, for, for basically this refactoring exercise. After your refactoring, where would you like to be, right? And then you come up with certain hypothesis in terms of how, what will take you from here to here. What is the uh, simplest way to go from uh, the baseline uh, current KPIs to the uh, target KPIs? Uh, so you come up with certain hypothesis and then you define an experiment to, uh, to basically, uh, you know, prove or disprove your hypothesis. Uh, you observe after the experiment, you observe the KPIs, you of course learn from this and then you repeat this cycle, okay? Again, uh, I wanna give you a couple of examples which are realistic so you can uh, you know, understand how we go about this. So let's assume I have done some static code analysis and I have picked this uh, you know, closed loop redemption file, uh, which seems to be uh, problematic. Why is it problematic? Because you know, according to Sonar, let's say the tech debt is uh, quite high. Uh, the code coverage is very low. This is a fairly big file, uh, you know, 2,442 2, lines. Uh, the reliability rating is pretty low and so forth, right? So these are all my baseline KPIs that I've got. Then basis this, I am going to define basically what is the end state I want to achieve? What is that I want to invest right now and get towards, right? Uh, once we define this, then we say, hey, what is our hypothesis? You know, uh, what will help us move from here to here quickly? So we can look at, hey, there is a large class smell. There's a black sheep smell. There are a lot of static methods. You know, there's a very high conditional complexity and so forth. So these are all the problems that if we address, uh, then we would be able to move from here to here. So there, there are certain hypotheses, let's say in terms of code smells that we identify. And then we put an experiment together saying, okay, I'm gonna time box uh, X amount of time. Uh, and I want to address these code smells by applying, uh, let's say a single responsibility principle or by uh, writing certain scaffolding tests or so forth. And then I would essentially, uh, here I'm missing the, uh, the actual KPIs. And then there is a validated learning that actually your ID can help you quite a bit with a lot of these things. Uh, this is what the team had captured. And then there would be certain action items in terms of maybe setting certain quality gates uh, so it avoids this future from uh, this from happening to future code uh, and uh, you can kind of iterate through this cycle a few times there's a similar example for db related stuff that uh, i have over here and again that kind of uh, you know we can use to uh, to help us uh, improve uh, you know some poorly performing let's say uh, or not having enough uh, you know 
indexes or so forth. So, uh, you know, these are a couple of examples. Sorry to, examples. Sorry to interrupt, it's just quick time check, 10 minutes to go, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Pavin. Uh, I'm actually pretty much wrapped up, two slides to go. So I went faster than I should have probably, uh, but I want to leave uh, 10 minutes for Q&A, so absolutely. So yeah, so these are a couple of examples of how we use uh, this uh, continuous evolution approach uh, in terms of basically, again, just to reiterate, prioritize the backlog item, which we've done so far, we've discussed about various prioritization techniques. Once we've done that, then we establish a baseline KPI uh, from these tools that we have we set a target KPI, we define a hypothesis, what is uh, you know, causing this and what could be addressed to, to basically get away from this uh, problem. And then we define a small experiment that we would run to, uh, you know, like in this case that I was talking about, I would basically uh, run uh, an experiment of uh, trying to eliminate, uh, you know, trying to apply single responsibility principle to eliminate some of these things. Uh, this, this same thing could be applied. We've applied it to, you know, basically replacing a language uh, with a newer language, uh, replacing a framework with a new framework. So for each of these, you can, you know, let's say if you want to replace a framework, what is the reason you want to replace the framework? What are the certain baseline KPIs that you would define? Is it performance? Is it developer experience? You know, you define certain KPIs. So you know, basically, uh, you know, what is the current state? And if you were to replace it with something new, uh, what is the target state that you're achieving? And, you know, you should be able to take a small slice of it, maybe a small part of your code and try and prove that hypothesis over there uh, before you decide to start, you know, basically changing a framework in the entire code base. Uh, so we've used this uh, approach quite heavily and uh, we found it very, very uh, useful to break large things into small chunks and then small things to make them data driven. Uh, so again, just to quickly wrap up uh, my talk, I know I'm a little uh, getting out of time for the Q&A. So uh, this is again, just to recap, you start with visualization of your current usage statistics and uh, you know the, the tools telling you uh, where you may have tech debt. Uh, there are also certain tech debts which the tool will not tell, but you have to figure out, like I gave you examples. Um, and then you have to decide uh, the step two would be to decide uh, between refactor rewrite and i would say you know a hybrid of the two generally would would be useful uh, then you would prioritize uh, using the several techniques in terms of from a usage perspective or from a tooling perspective. And then finally, you would uh, strategize using the continuous evolution uh, approach that I talked about. That is uh, pretty much it, uh, what I had. So I will quickly stop sharing my screen and look at uh, the questions folks may have. Um, okay. Uh, I see that we have uh, about nine questions. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll quickly go through this. Uh, and uh, if, if uh, folks have uh, more questions, please do add them in. So the first question I see here from Venkat, uh, basically, uh, what is the source of this information about the source uh, of uh, debt? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, Venkat is referring to the early slides because this is at 406. So at the right beginning, the, some of the graphs that I showed. So that's a little open source tool again that we've built called NGOscope. Uh, this NGOscope hooks into, uh, you know, as of today, it hooks into Azure DevOps, uh, which is a, uh, you know, overall uh, DevOps tool, uh, you know, it, similar to a lot of other tools I mean that you might be familiar with you know there is an Atlassian stack there may be a you know uh, the Atlassian stack as in Jira and all of the tools that come with it so Azure Microsoft has its own uh, you know stack called Azure DevOps so we basically hook into that and uh, we pull all of these stats and it's a it's an open source project you can look up it's called NGOscope uh, so that's that's the source of the information all right uh, the next question is, please share the source of this information about tech debt. Okay, uh, so already done that. Uh, moving to the next question. Many teams have started creating tech debt uh, deliver deliberately to reduce time to market, but that leads to too much rework and cost 
of uh, cost at late stages okay uh, what could be the right time to start working on prioritizing and self uh, prioritizing the self induced debt uh, if a program uh, slash project is one year long uh, managing uh, tech debt at the end of the project uh, release may be too much cost okay so this is again a interesting uh, question uh, let me actually mark these as answered this is an interesting question in fact uh, this morning after uh, ward stock uh, we were uh, on the hangout table talking about this is uh, you know is self induced debt a bad thing uh, you know and, and 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 there are two ways to look at self induced debt right one form of self induced debt is like hey the the business or the product folks are saying that this particular feature is is going to drive like a huge amount of uh, business or you know is going to move certain business kpis by a large number right and you say well that's great that's that's a bet that's a hypothesis right that's what you're thinking so what i want to do is i want to run a very cheap experiment where i'm not going to care about uh, you know the code quality or things like that i just want to do a, a skateboard version of this feature i'm going to just hack something very quickly together and i want to validate whether uh, the business hypothesis actually holds good or not uh, you know i don't want to be worrying about performance because business thinks this is going to bring 100 million users using this i really want to see if even five people use this and at that stage i might not really need to worry about performance or other kinds of things so uh, if if you if this is the form of deliberate tech debt then i think this is awesome right i i would encourage teams to absolutely do this uh because uh you know as again i'm i'm uh, going back to what's keynote he he mentioned that uh you know we have uh you know a lot of problems nobody knows uh you know the full problem uh we all still discovering in many cases and it's a complex adaptive world which means uh things will also evolve as you go along right so uh you know if this is the form of debt that you're referring to i think this is cool and and some experiments will be successful uh, some business hypothesis will be validated which means yes we now need to scale this to a large extent and we need to now go back and uh, improve this uh, and and uh, it really doesn't matter if you think of this as debt or whatever but you tried a quick experiment it you validated if it's successful you scale it if it it didn't it didn't succeed you discard it uh, important thing is to discard the code right and that's where that ex, uh, expiry date analogy uh, you know it's important to keep the michael feathers expiry date analogy in mind uh, is always think that code has expiry date and some day it will go away right like some day you have to delete it so if if uh, to uh, to miss or miss uh, mr anonymous attendee if that is your uh, form of uh, that's your definition of self induced uh, debt then i think it's great uh, and you should do that but if your definition of self induced debt is that i know uh, i have the time i know exactly what is required there's no ambiguity but just for the fun of it i am going to just write extremely sloppy code so that i can come back later and spend more time at it uh, that of course is uh, not not recommended uh, but i i personally don't believe uh, developers would do that uh, because it's obviously more work just for them uh, so often this uh, this uh, self induced debt uh, could be confused to people just playing around uh, but uh, you know the way i would like to look at it is people are trying to validate whether it's worth uh, you know engineering this or i can just you know get away without it uh, you know and so that that's a good thing in my opinion i uh, hope i've answered that uh interesting chart which tool uh are using for this uh, again uh, yeah flow efficiency feature versus bug etc yeah so a lot of these are uh, from the tool that i mentioned ngo scope it's open source you can go and uh, have a look at it uh you know i'll also put a link if uh, anyone's interested uh then there is a, another another question from venkat in the context of microservices it seems to me that uh, the impact of uh, tech debt would be less significant as opposed to probably business or architectural debt what are your uh, thoughts uh, when it comes to how tech debt correlates to implementation architecture okay so uh, like i was trying to uh, 
clarify earlier to me tech debt is not only about code right tech debt is a, you know if you have architectural issues it is also a tech debt for me uh, so I, I i look at tech debt in a much broader sense rather than just code quality so you know having architectural problems having performance related issues these are all forms of tech debt and they all have to be holistically looked and prioritized uh, you know sometimes the architectural ones are going to hit you much harder uh, than the uh, than the code related ones, uh, but in certain contexts, the code related one will probably hurt you more than the architectural one. The architectural one, maybe when you really scale out, uh, you may need to worry about it. But uh, you know, when when you are uh, when you are at a smaller scale, if you have a lot of uh, issues with the code, it's too complex, it's buggy, then uh, probably that's going to hurt you. So it's contextual, but uh, look at tech that holistically, in my view. All right, the next one, uh, sorry, uh, I'm out of time. Yeah. Uh, I greatly appreciate all the questions. Uh, fantastic. Thanks again, everyone, uh, for joining in.